Hello and welcome to the Rock and Roll to Success. Today I have offer Jade Cessna with me and Jade is the offer of Dreamer to Doer. It's about making your wildest dreams a reality and it's not woo woo at all. Actually, it's very down to earth. It's pretty much a blueprint of how you can achieve success and what's important to you and only you. And we were talking about this before and you write it in the book, Jade. Actually, you changed the outline of this book last minute. So how was this? I did. And yes. Welcome to the rock and roll. Yes, thank you so much. So hi, everybody. My name is Jade Cessna. Um, and like Gabe said, I changed the book completely as the deadline for finalizing the topic and the outline of my book approached. Um, about a few weeks after I moved back to my hometown, I moved back in with my parents to pursue writing this book. Um, I started outlining a book that a book and a book topic that I had had on my mind for about six months, and I was like, okay, when I move back to my hometown, when I move back in with my parents, this is the book that I'm going to write. And as I sat there writing, you know, outlining it, trying to make sure that I was hitting on the topics that I wanted to write about, I had this idea and I was like, wow, like, I'm really doing this. I'm really writing a book. And I started thinking about, I was like, my past self, like little Jade would be so ecstatic that she's writing a book right now because I grew up with a love of reading and writing. And so the fact that I was actually just freaking doing it and writing a book, she would be so ecstatic. So I started thinking about my past self and then I thought about, okay, well, where do I want to be 10 years down the line? I started thinking about my future self. And then it occurred to me, I was like, what would be most helpful for me right now is actually writing a book about the relationship between my past, present, and future self and how that allows me to leverage the visions that I have for my life and the type of success that I want for myself. So about a week before I had the deadline to finalize the outline of my book, I completely changed the topic and I outlined the whole book in like maybe two or three days. And I was like, all right, this is the one, this is the one that I'm writing about um, and completely pivoted the, the topic. So it was scary because I, cause I was going back and forth. I was like, oh my gosh, should I do this? I mean, I just came up with the idea a few days ago. Is it even a substantial enough idea to go on? But it ended up working out. So we're all good and we're here now. Yeah, I think it ended up working out fabulously because like I was talking to you before, it's very well done, it's very well put together. And Thank you. it's almost like an autobiography. I see you talking mm -hmm. to your past little Jay yeah. a lot. Yeah. Directly and indirectly with a lot of examples of how you use the tools that you talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very useful to pretty much anyone that reads it. Like yeah. the tools, they can be used. And I really like the Venn diagrams as well. Thank you. So as you said as well, you were always obsessed about reading and mm -hmm. also about dancing ballet, of course. Yes. But you talk about this in your book that you were always with a book in hand. Even when your parents wanted to get out of the house, you were reading while you were changing your clothes. Yeah. And they had a hard time dealing with that. Even while doing chores, they had to make you stop reading. Mm -hmm. But somewhere down the line, you kind of lost that passion that obsession for reading and writing because of school so mm -hmm. how was that for you yeah yeah so I talk about how when I was a kid I was constantly glued to a good book and when I got in trouble as a kid my parents would take away my books because that was way more punishing than them taking away my toys or anything like that um, and I journaled ever since I was little like I still have journals from when I was like 10 or 11 years old and it's really funny the problems that 10 year old Jade had on the on the playground um, but I had this love very intuitively since I was a little girl um, but as I started getting older I would take like advanced reading or writing classes in school um, and due to that I would have to read assigned books by the teachers that maybe I wasn't really interested in reading or I'd have to write in a specific format you know like MLA or APA format making sure that I had 10 peer-reviewed articles in my um, in my argumentative essay you know that kind of thing so 
Writing in school made me forget about the love for writing and reading that I had because I didn't have the opportunity to do it for fun and to do it creatively. Um, And I do remember taking one creative writing class in college and, you know, the professor was basically like, you can write about whatever you want. It just needs to be like this certain length or whatever. Um, but I really was like, oh my gosh, I forgot how much I love writing because I haven't been able to creatively write in such a long time. Um, and so I talk about that a lot in my book because I think that it's it's a common thing that people experience that their childhood passions kind of get buried under the realities of the world as we get older and as we try to maybe find a career path or a job that will give us enough money to sustain a certain lifestyle that we want and things like that. So I really encourage people to always reflect on those things that kind of came really naturally to them because like my little brother, he has always been very naturally drawn to cars. Ever since he was little, he played with the little Hot Wheels and the match Matchbox cars Um, And that has, you know, we've um, been able to see evidence of his love for cars throughout his life as he started to get his mechanics license. And now he buys junk cars and flips them for a profit and he details cars, like all these different things. And it's like, I mean, my parents didn't really like try to raise him to like cars. He just always Mm -hmm. kind of did. You know what I mean? So like, what is that thing in your life that you just always kind of loved? And how can you express that? as an adult. Yeah, this is so important and this is one of the things that I can get behind as well because one of the main things that I try to talk about is about those old passions that we had as kids or when we were younger and Mm -hmm. eventually we end up losing those things and at the end of the day they are parts of our core identity even if we forget about them and you talk about this a lot in your book so how do you think that we could make it easier for kids to never lose that spirit and never lose sight of those things. I think it's important for us to foster kids' natural curiosity that they have about life. I think as we get older, we adults kind of lose that curiosity and we lose that imagination. So kind of helping kids foster that curiosity um, and allowing them to take time to explore every interest that they had because as a kid, like I was interested in doing theater, so I wanted to try out for the musicals and the plays at school. Um, I was a dancer, as you mentioned, and I did that for a majority of my life, but I also really loved cooking and baking, and I had a baking business when I was younger. Like There are just so many different interests. My parents always let me explore them, and they always helped me invest into the interests, even if the interest only lasted a few months or like a year or something like that. Like it doesn't have to be a lifelong passion, um, but my parents allowed me to explore all of those to whatever extent I wanted to. And I think that that was really helpful. Yeah, that's quite a privilege to have a supporting For sure. parents. And For sure. yeah, like you said, when we were kids, we're experimenting and discovering, figuring out what things we actually love. And Mm-hmm. One day you end up finding out, oh, it's writing in your case, yeah. or it can be music, it can be like your brother, cars, mm-hmm. it can be anything, but you yeah. need to test things out to figure out what you actually love. For sure, exactly. So at the beginning of the book, you talk about that story of when you were in the car and mm-hmm. you were looking at the trees and you start imagining what would be the vision, how, how could I become the tallest tree? Yeah. And that's how you kind of subconsciously maybe kind of developed a method to think about the future and think Mm -hmm. about how you can leverage your present actions, your present thoughts, your your present in in general and make your future come true in a way. So Mm -hmm. how how did little Jade from such a young age have so much insight? (laughs) Yeah, um, I think there's a few things that played into that. First and foremost, my parents did not give my brother and I electronics growing up. This was huge. We didn't have um, like iPads or anything. So when we went on long road trips, 
we had to pack activities to do like a coloring book or we had to have a book with us to read or things like that or we just had to entertain ourselves using our imagination which is exactly what happened when I came up with this whole you know how do I become the biggest tree in the forest um, imagination game that I played when I was younger. I think the second thing is, is my dad actually graduated with a degree in philosophy. And so growing up, he always asked me very thought provoking questions as a kid. So that kind of wired my brain to start thinking about maybe more intellectual or just just deeper things than maybe the average 12 year old would be thinking about. Um, and I was just so excited to grow up and do the things that I saw the adults around me doing. Like I was excited to have a family and have kids and work a job and have my own house and all these different things. Um, but I understood that there was hard work behind that, that you just didn't get those things handed to you on a silver platter. I saw how hard my parents worked for the future and the life that they built for my brother and I. Um, both of my parents went to college as adults, so I got to see them studying for classes and I attended their college graduation and I just really got a unique perspective on what it takes to um, strive for the success that you're trying to get in your life, right? And so I think that those two things together, the fact that A, I didn't have electronics and was forced to use my imagination, and B, that I grew up in a very like philosophical household where, you know, asked to me as a child, I think both of those things kind of allowed me to see the bigger picture of life and what I wanted to make my life um, look like. Yeah, that's very interesting. It's not every day that we see someone with a philosopher as a dad. Yeah, I know, so, I know. Yeah, I'd like to dig in a little more on how how is that, like growing up, what kind of questions would you ask you and your brother? What kind of games? How was that yeah. growing up with someone that tries to ask you the deeper questions when you're still a little kid? When I was a little kid, I found it more annoying than anything else. <laughs> like, I was like, why does he have to ask me these types of questions? Why can't we just have a normal conversation? You know what I mean? So it was all, it was always, if I asked him a question, he would never flat out answer it. He would ask me a question, <laughs> like ask me a question back to me to try to get me to draw my own conclusions about things, me, the answers to questions, and then me taking them as truth. You know what I mean? Like he allowed me yeah. to kind of develop my own truth in that way through asking me questions. Um, but as a kid, it was very annoying, and I often got frustrated with him because I was like, I don't care, like, why God exists, or why this and that, or why I feel this way. Like, can we please just, like, I don't know, just talk about something else. Um, but looking back, I really appreciate it because at first, it allowed me to um, deeply consider what my morals and principles are that I want to live my life by. Um, but then also it allowed me to better see other people's perspectives and to be able to really consider all sides of the situation um, and not inherently believe or think that the way that I perceive things is the ultimate truth because that's not true. Not at all. And it's interesting to think that he pretty much taught you the Socratic method Mm -hmm. without you yeah. knowing at the time <laughs> yeah yeah and... i know and then we would use that in like english classes like the the teachers would have specific days where we would have socratic seminars about topics and they would say okay here's the topic we're gonna have a socratic seminar about it on friday make sure you prepare your thoughts and i'm like looking at this i'm like i've been doing this my whole life <laughs> i don't i don't need to do this you know so you always crush the competition <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was, I learned a lot by doing those with other people that wasn't my dad. But yeah, it was a good time. And by having all of these interesting conversations, of course, when you were a little kid, you'd get a bit irritated with him. Mm -hmm. But later on down the line, did you start getting a little bored when people would talk about things that were just scratching the surface and not going into the deep things? 
Um, I would say that I was the type of person who, if we met for the first time, I would pretty much skip over the small talk and go straight into like trying to figure out who you are as a person, what has happened in your life to make you who you are now, that kind of thing. Like I was actually just talking to my mom the other day. I cannot watch a TV show, like a sitcom, a completely fictional TV show without like psycholo psychologically analyzing the characters. And being like, mm -hmm. well, this character said that because they feel this way and they had this happen in their life. And, da -da 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 -da. and I'm like, oh my gosh, can I just turn it off? Like, I just want to watch a TV show and not be like psychologically evaluating these people. <laughs> so do you think that you can never really relax because you're always have, you always have something in your mind in the background? For sure, for sure. And I've had to learn how to... Um, be okay with the way that my mind works because I specifically remember in 2020 when COVID hit, um, I was spending so much time alone for the first time in my life, really. Um, and I started being afraid of my mind and the thoughts that would come up and the things that I would, I would think about. I'm like, I just felt like trapped, like I just couldn't turn off the thoughts. And so since I think COVID and spending an abundant amount of time by myself, I've had to learn how to find contentment in the way that my brain works and, and be okay with it, um, but also try to find peace and be like, okay, well, I might not be able to turn my brain off, but what are some things that I can do to kind of maybe quiet the voices in the background and to be able to find peace and not feel so much maybe anxiety associated with it? Yeah. Would you be comfortable sharing a little bit what kind of voices were they more associated with things like because you've always been the kind of go-getter type of girl and always wanted to get the good grades and all of that. So were there, they more concerning like success or concerning business, that kind of thing? Or were, was there something else? Yeah, I mean... COVID first hit my freshman year of college. And so uh, college was really the first time that I left my house in my hometown and I moved two and a half hours away to start experiencing life in a different way than I had had before and really creating my own identity. And then, you know, like five months into moving out, um, COVID happened and I had to move back in with my parents. And it felt like this life that I was finally building for myself all came crashing down. On top of that, I actually graduated college in three years. And in order to get all the credits that I needed to graduate, I had to take very specific classes every semester at very specific times so that I could make sure I was getting all the credits that I needed. So I had this plan mapped out in my head. And so as soon as COVID hit, I was like, first of all, I had to move back home and I wasn't expecting that. And then second of all, that plan kind of went out the window. I was taking online classes now. I didn't know how long COVID was going to last. I didn't know how bad COVID was going to be. Um, I wasn't with anyone except for my immediate family. I wasn't seeing my grandparents, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles. I wasn't seeing any of my friends. Um, and so being in that situation where I was taking online classes, I was spending a lot of time by myself and my life pretty much just took a 180 from what it was of like, you know, why does this happen? If you believe in a God, why does God let these things happen? Um, you know, it's, it's scary, especially towards the beginning of COVID when we really didn't know what it was and how bad it could or couldn't be. It was really scary because people were, you know, raiding grocery stores and trying to buy all the food and the toilet paper. And you're worried about your grandparents because they're the most at risk age group. And you don't know how long this is going to last and you don't know what your life is going to look like. So it's just all of those questions kind of forming around my head. And at the time I had an Etsy business. So I was like, well, how does this impact my Etsy business? And you know, how does this impact the, the friendships that I just started making in college? And how does it impact my life and my success that I, you know, had planned for myself a few years down the line and outside of college and things like that. Um, and so it was just really questioning like the fundamentals of like a worldwide pandemic happening and how that influences my life um, more than it was I don't know, just, just questioning maybe any other surface level, level things, like why can't I go see my friends, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, COVID was terrible for everyone, but I think especially for someone like you that 
always thinks ahead and thinks about her future like 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line. Even though in your book, of course, you talk about how you can leverage the different timelines. So mm -hmm. the more present or near future, like one year from now and then mm -hmm. three to four years from now and from then on, because like you say in your book as well, in 2015, we could never predict the pandemic or, and we can't yeah. predict what will happen five years from now. So no. it doesn't make that much of a sense to try to predict the details. Of course, you might mm -hmm. think like big picture in 10 years from now, where I want to be, but mm -hmm. you can't predict the details. Mm -hmm. So I think for someone like you that has this ingrained from a young age, that must have been even harder than for regular people, quote unquote. Well, and looking back, I mean, at the time it was very hard, but it also taught me a great lesson in like, hey, you might have this plan set out for your life, but there's no guarantee that life is going to go according to that plan. And just because life doesn't go according to plan doesn't mean that life is any less valuable or that you're any less valuable or less successful or, you know, X, Y, Z. So I think I really needed that lesson of like, hey, it's okay if the plan doesn't work out, your life is still going to be worth it and you're still going to find success and you're still going to be happy, you know? Yeah, we need to find a way to be happy regardless mm -hmm. of the circumstances, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And you talk a lot about mindsets, perspectives and the understanding of the world that we have in your book. So what kind of tips would you give someone that wants to improve their mindsets or rethink their perspectives in life? Whew, that is such a broad question. That this is a intimidating one to answer. First and foremost, I would hope that people understand that there's a lot of factors that go into the mindset that you have. Um, there's a lot of people who struggle and who have actual mental disabilities and, you know, struggle with depression or PTSD or OCD or anything like that. Um, that really does impact the way that they perceive the world. Um, but there's also circumstances or events that happened in your childhood that frame your mind and your perception of the world um, or where you live currently or where you work or who you work with. Um, all of these things come together to form your mindset. It's not just the thoughts that you have that form your mindset, but it's a culmination of all these different factors. Even from like your um, physical health and your diet and you know your emotional and mental and spirituality, like perspective through which you see life. Um, but one book that I read that really impacted my view of reality is the book Life of Pi. It's a pretty famous book, and it's about a boy who um, gets into a shipwreck and ends up on a buoy, like a just like a smaller little boat, um, with a tiger, and they travel the sea together. Are you familiar? Have you ever read this book? I haven't, but I've seen the trailer for the okay, movie, the but movie. <laughs> I didn't really okay. read it. Okay, okay. So anyways... You get this boy's perspective on traveling the ocean and trying to find land so that he can survive the shipwreck that he just went through. In the end of the book, I'm not going to spoil it, but I definitely recommend reading the book or watching the movie. I haven't watched the movie, but I'm going to assume that the book is better than the movie. Okay, so if you can read the yeah. book, <laughs> then read the Generally book. Generally, they are. <laughs> yeah, usually they are. Um, but at the end of the end of the book, the author um, kind of dro drops a bomb on the audience. And you're like, holy crap, the past 200 pages that I've read isn't even what I thought it was. And it makes you question reality and the perception that you have about your reality. And the lesson that I learned from this book specifically is that you are in charge of how you view your reality. And I think that that is really important because it's very easy to, it's not fun to take responsibility for how we perceive our life and what our mindsets are and what our reality is. No, everybody wants to pass the blame and be like, well, it's, I have trauma. So it's, it's that it's the trauma's fault. Or like, I, you know, I struggle with this. So it's, it's that like everybody tries to push the responsibility away, but really the perspective that you have on your life and your reality is your responsibility and you can choose choose 
what you want your reality to be. And that book specifically really helped me see that. So if you have an opportunity to read it, I definitely would. Yeah, I've, I've noted it down so I can get a chance Good. to read it too. <laughs> awesome. But I, I think it's really funny that you say that it's not, it's not fun to, like, to change your mindset, that kind and of thing. And take responsibility. And take mm -hmm. responsibility, yeah. I think in the beginning it isn't, of course, because mm -hmm. we have those ingrained victim mindsets that come mm -hmm. from everywhere. Mm -hmm. But when you start doing this, when you start thinking about your, your mindsets, your core beliefs, your core values, and there are some exercises. I think you're probably familiar with this book, um, Unleash the Giant Within from Tony Robbins. I've heard of that. I haven't read it, but I'm somewhat familiar, yes. Yeah, but you're familiar with Tony and what yes. he's all about. <laughs> yeah. So when I read that book, it was such a mind-blowing event because he talks about how all of your beliefs are related to thoughts. I mean, that book really talks to your book in a sense because you, t you make this connection as well between how you talk to yourself and others and mm -hmm. like how that impacts the way you see the world, you see yourself, you see everything. Really? Yeah, yeah. And how that changes your mindset. And when you start thinking about this more consciously and trying to change your mindset for the better, when you start taking responsibility, things just start clicking in your life. Mm -hmm. Things really start to, you get to that escape velocity and you're able mm -hmm. to do incredible things. Like you wrote a book and published it in what, six months? 60 days i well i wrote it in 60 days and then i published it it took about three or four more months to publish it so yes it was six months six months from start to end yeah so that's amazing like and you'd never be able to do that without all of that work you did before on your mindsets and mm -hmm. believing yourself mm -hmm. so and taking the, responsibility is fundamental yeah i mean and it helps you gain clarity on what you want for your life when you take responsibility for your life but also, I mean, you mentioned that um, I didn't just come out of the, the gate being able to write this book. It was many years of building discipline and saying and building up the self-talk of being like, OK, if I believe that I can do something, then I'm going to actually do it. And I'm going to match my thoughts, words and actions and make sure that they align. Right. Because. I can think that I can write a book and I can tell other people that I'm going to write a book, but if I don't align my actions with that, then it's like, then what am I, I'm, I'm creating this false identity within myself if I am thinking and saying that I can do something, but I'm not actually doing it. There's going to be that disconnect there, creating that false identity in myself, which kind of leads you of not really knowing who you are, what you want to do. Um, clearly with your life and so one of the biggest things is that I wrote this manuscript in 60 days and in order to do so I had to write 1,500 usable words I say usable words because when you write you don't always use the words you're going to write mm -hmm. in the book right so I had to write 1,500 usable words every single day in order to write a full book in 60 days and I would not have been able to do that if I hadn't built the discipline building in high school um, because I wanted to be a good college student and I wanted to study well for my exams and pass my classes and things like that. So in high school, I was like, okay, I'm gonna start building my discipline now, making sure that I am studying adequately and with enough time before my exams and X, Y, Z, and then that leaked into being a good college student and then that leaked into being able to write a manuscript of a book in 60 days. Um, so yeah, it was a, a buildup of being able to do this. And I think that maybe because, I mean, I'm 23, right? And so I'm relatively young to be a published author. Um, but I think that people are like, oh, she, she just must have like the juice. She just must have it. And it's like, no, no, I don't like, people always say that I'm smart. I'm like, I, I'm not smart. I'm just hardworking and I apply myself. That's really all it is. And I wish people understood that because they think that they need to have some or some certain level of skill or talent or ability to do something. It's like, no, you just need to be hardworking. You need to apply yourself and that's how you will get there. Yeah. There's no such thing as an overnight success. 
Right, exactly, exactly. And you know, I think sometimes being too smart can even be detrimental because you kind of yes. get lazy. You never yeah. know how to be that hardworking or have that work ethic. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And I really like that in your book, you talk a lot about this. You have all of these examples like Mr. Beast, like Alex mm -hmm. Ramosi, and talking about how the media would never like go to some random guy on the street who's grinding his ass off like every day. Right. They wouldn't, that story, if he's not successful yet, no one wants to hear about it. But exactly. the moment you achieve that level of success, then everyone wants to talk about you. Yes, exactly. And that's what I also talk about Matt Reif, and he's a famous comedian, and he's actually from my hometown, Columbus, Ohio. And it's crazy because it seemingly he blew up overnight and out of nowhere, and he was suddenly booking national tours and selling out all these venues and all these different things. And I'm like, hold up. He, he's been doing stand-up comedy for 10 years now. He's literally been performing since he was 15 years old. So, and nobody's going to pay attention. Like, a, a camera crew is not going to follow around 15-year-old Matt Reif, who's bombing these sets that he's trying to do and, and you know, trying to build up his um, presence on stage and his jokes and his repertoire, right? Like, nobody cares about the person who's hustling and grinding, but everybody cares about the person who has this sudden success and is driving around the Lambo and is experiencing all of these things that people want to experience. So I think that's just kind of the mindset that we have to have because quite frankly, I don't expect any success to come from this book. Now, if I continue to write and I publish one book for the next 10 years, do I expect one of those books to pop off? Yes, because I've been working at it for 10 years and I've been iterating and trying to get better, right? So. I mean, I think that's, we just have to have such a long, a way longer term vision for success than people think that they need to have. Yeah, I think you have to give yourself that runway until, mm -hmm. like, how long do I accept not having the success I mm -hmm. wish I had? Because, mm -hmm. like you said, it takes years upon years of hard work and every single day that, actually, every single day that you don't do the work, you don't put in the good habits, you're actually putting a, a stone in your way, like, mm -hmm. yeah. instead of being a stepping stone, it's something in your way of yeah. getting to where you want to go. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's the thing is, I think that um, people will put in that effort at the forefront because they're excited. They're like, yes, this is a new project that I get to work on. And then if they don't immediately, like if someone were to write a book, if they don't immediately reach the success that they have in their mind of being, you know, world's best selling author, making millions off of their book, then they're like, okay, this isn't for me. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa you have just started, you've just dipped your toe into writing, like how can you already try to say that, you know, this isn't for you if you haven't found the literal ultimate or the peak of success <laughs> from the first attempt that you've made? Yeah, like uh, a top doctor wouldn't expect to be the top doctor in one year, so why exactly. should you be expecting yeah. anything else? Yeah, yeah. And a thing I found very interesting that you talk about in your book was about skills because it's very easy to think about the skills that you actually see. So someone that speaks really well in public, like Matt Rife, he does the jokes very well. But at the same time, what about his work ethic? What about the, the days in which he wasn't feeling that well, but he went anyway? What mm -hmm. about all of these un intangibles that you can't mm -hmm. really see if you don't know the person, but they have to develop them? as they go. So could you talk a little bit more about those hidden skills? Yeah, of course. So in writing this book, I mostly geared it to young adults. Um, but I've had people of all ranges, re or all age ranges read this book and gain something from it, which has been really cool. Um, but in the process of writing this book, I interviewed old teachers and professors that I had. And it seems like kids nowadays or young adults nowadays, they know what they want for their lives and they know what they need to get there, but they don't have kind of like the fundamental attributes that allow them to get there, like the intangibles we were talking about. And so 
in my book, I refer to them as the obvious and hidden skills. And I say for a potter to be a successful potter, they obviously need to build the skill of ceramics and being able to work with clay and things like that. But also for a potter to be a successful potter, they need to understand the market and when to sell bowls versus plates or like, you know, understand what opportunities they can create for themselves to sell these things. And they need to be able to iterate on their work and try new techniques and get better at the at molding the clay like there's just so many intangibles that I don't think people realize that they need to have to find success of being of like there's um have you ever read the book rich dad poor dad yeah okay in the book um he talks about how he's not that good of a writer um, but he is good at selling and it is called a best selling author. It's not called a best writing author. <laughs> and so the reason why his book has done so well is because he can sell it well, not necessarily because he's a great writer. You know what I mean? And so those are some of the, like the intangibles that I think that we need to be focusing on in order to find the success that we want and really be able to be equipped with the right things that lead us to that success. And talking about writing and being successful and selling and all of that, what kind of advice would you give to someone that's just starting with writing because you also started your Medium blog and yeah. you were writing four uh, posts a week yeah. and then eventually a few months down the line you, you wrote your book. So what kind of advice would you give them? especially in the intangible sector because the tangible mm -hmm. is okay you, you need to write a lot you need to mm -hmm. write every day you need to try to write better every time you write but right what about the intangibles all of those things that you don't necessarily know you should be doing yeah i would say some intangibles and this could really go for anybody. I don't think it's just for someone who would want to be a writer, or be an author, but some of the intangible skills that have brought me to where I am today is the fact that I have wired my brain to see ideas everywhere. And I think that's really important is a lot of people feel like they just can't come up with ideas. And so I really wired my brain. I said, okay, my brain is not going to be for worrying about the future or about, you know, thinking about the past and what I could have done better, or, you know, X, Y, Z, like my brain is going to be for detecting ideas and opportunities everywhere I look. So once I chose for my brain, brain to kind of be this uh, detector of ideas and success and opportunities, my perspective on my reality really changed a lot. Um, another intangible I think is important for anybody who is seeking success is the way that you talk about yourself to yourself and to others. And we touched on this um, previously a few minutes back, but I don't think we realize the ways in which we talk about ourselves and what that means for our confidence and our self-belief, right? There are many opportunities where we formally get to speak about ourselves, like being a guest on a podcast or doing an interview, um, but there's also ways informally that we talk about ourselves. If we make an offhanded comment about how we aren't good at this or that or how we suck or how, you know, blah, 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 like all of these offhanded comments contribute to the identity that you have about yourself and thus what you will be able to achieve in life. And so if I were to say like any two of the top intangible skills that people don't really realize, it would be those two. Yeah, I think offhanded comments are the worst because mm -hmm. sometimes you make a little joke about something like, I'm not that good at this or that, mm -hmm. but subconsciously you're telling yourself that you like your subconscious doesn't know if you're joking or not. It just right. You're Gets reinforcing you're the saying. idea. Yeah. 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 And that's what, like, um, I started really paying attention to how I introduced myself to other people um, because I often found that when I met someone new, they would say, you know, hey, I'm John and I work in IT. And it was like, okay, well, why is that the first thing that everybody ties their identity to? Why is that? Why do we always introduce what we do for work first? I was like, okay, it must be our most important identity to ourselves or where we find ourselves the most valuable. I was like, okay, well, what if 
I didn't want to really work in IT and I didn't enjoy working in IT and instead I wanted to write a book. Like if I keep introducing myself as John who works in IT, that's all I will ever see myself as. So if I wanted to pivot my career to become an author, then maybe I should stop introducing myself as John who works in IT and start to take on and to be able to start to align my thoughts, words, and actions with the real success that I want to find in my life. Yeah, that's a very American thing, you know, <laughs> to use your job title as the first mm -hmm. thing you talk about yourself. Yeah. So you didn't want to be the girl that worked with um, energy anymore or with green energy anymore you want it to be the offer yes exactly and now that is my identity and that's all that's something funny too is like I it's people have started asking me you know what do you do for work and I'm like now I actually get to say that I'm an author and that's how I primarily use my time and what I primarily do for work and that is so freaking cool that's what I want to say about myself that is what I've been dreaming about saying about myself right and I'm sure when I have kids it'll be I'm a mother to three kids you know that kind of thing like that's the identity that will be most important to me so I don't know I just I don't think that we pay attention enough to how we talk about ourselves and that can be really detrimental yeah definitely not definitely not i think that's it's important that you raise awareness on this topic because people mm -hmm. never think about it and mm -hmm. they should for sure but do you think w once you're a mother you'll stop writing <laughs> no i think i'll be writing my whole life maybe i'll start writing children's books which i think would be really fun um, but I think I'll, I'll always be a writer. Yeah, because the way you defined it, it seemed like you'd just be a mother and not more a writer, and that would be a yeah. shame. You shouldn't yeah. stop. <laughs> right, right. Even Thank if you. <laughs> you have less time, just do it on the side. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what, what about, you talk about a lot about mindsets and the final four mindsets, which I really liked, which would be about baby stepping, about visualizing about timing and about developing habits. Mm -hmm. So how did you figure this out and how could we implement this in our lives and like day to day? Yeah, so the final four mindsets that I write about in my book are kind of the big picture mindsets that I hope people um, will develop throughout their lives um, because I think that there's a lot of different mindsets that kind of trickle down from those big four mindsets that you have and being able to wire your brain to have that perspective allows you to kind of see the whole picture of your life because I think it's very easy to get hyper focused on certain aspects of our lives without zooming out and trying to see the big picture consequences of things or just how all the pieces of your life will come together and so one of the big four mindsets that I talk about is the importance of habits, but also not focusing too much on the habits themselves, but on what the habits allow you to do. And that is something that I got totally wrong, um, especially during college. I was really focused on trying to form these good habits without taking advantage of the things that the habits allowed me to do. And I think that's the point of forming good habits, is not just having the habits themselves, but on what the habits contribute to your life as a whole. And I totally missed that. Um, and so I wanted to be able to express <laughs> that, that mindset that I totally missed and then had to come in to learn for myself. And so an example, of that would be like forming um let's go with working out every day so um people will say i want to start a habit of working out because i want to look good on the beach when i'm wearing my swimsuit or like i want to gain muscle and all these different things it's like okay well what about like the big picture of you'll get to like live longer you'll get to be more active with your kids. You'll get to be able to take care of your parents when they're older. Like, let's zoom out and see these big picture things that being healthy allows you to do. Um, and it's not just like the physical healthiness, but it makes your brain stronger. And maybe you'll be able to think of better ideas because of it, or you'll be able to have more energy throughout the day to be able to get work done. You know what I mean? Like, trying to zoom out and not be so focused on 
creating the habit just for the habit's sake, but creating the habit for the things that it'll allow you to do in your life, I think is an, an important mindset shift that we have as a society probably. Yeah, I love this example because a couple of years ago I started taking going to the gym, that kind of thing more seriously, exactly mm -hmm. because of the point you mentioned, because I'm thinking more about longevity than how mm -hmm. I look right now. So mm -hmm. if I want to be 60 and be active and everything, I need to be active now and be healthy For now. Sure. Because exactly. you can't expect 30 years down the line to be healthier than you are now. So yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, when exactly. I started taking that more seriously. But another thing, I like to mention and it goes down it goes back to what we were talking a few minutes ago is sometimes we look at those people that are at the top so you think like let's see what Jeff Bezos does for his routine and mm -hmm. oh he meditates he <laughs> goes for a marathon every morning yeah. he, he does this 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 and wow he has such a good work-life balance right now but yeah right now now that he's a billionaire now that he actually doesn't even need to work anymore he can't yeah. afford that but when you're coming from the bottom you you have like you just can't afford to have work-life balance you'll have to be mm -hmm. like 100 percent foot to the pedal mm -hmm. and one day hopefully you'll achieve that but in the beginning you can't expect that well, and that's the thing too, it's like if we see successful people meditating for 20 minutes every day and we start meditating for 20 minutes every day, we're doing it for the wrong reason because the reason they meditate is not to be successful, it's to find inner peace and to align their thoughts and their physical body, right? And, but the reason why we start to meditate is because we want to be successful, but that's not the point of meditation. The point of meditation is to find peace within your mind and, you know, to align your mind and your body and all these different things. Um, so I think that when we see successful people have these certain habits, we go into it with the wrong intentions, which also doesn't make us want to really um, foster or maintain the habits for a long time either. Yeah, because they're not true to you. They are something that you think you should be doing, but not necessarily something that you should. Right, so exactly. So it goes back to when you talk about your future self and how you want to become that person. So you want to become the person that works out or the person that meditates or does whatever, writes every day. Mm -hmm. But you want to become that person for a reason because for you, you think that that's what you want to, with your life and you need to have a reason it's not because mm -hmm. you're emulating someone that you saw on the mm -hmm. news that was doing that kind of thing right exactly one thing that you talk about that I found was interesting as well on the book was about the right path and how sometimes we may end up thinking that the path we are in is the only one that's right or the best path possible and never think about going another way so being kind of stubborn, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I see more people today doing the opposite. That's having shiny object syndrome and yeah. doing something for a month and then doing yeah. something else for a couple of months, but they never nail down. So sort of they didn't have what we talked about in the beginning about when you're a child exploring and finding out mm, what you really yeah. want. Yeah. And now after they're older, they, they're trying to do that. So how do you think we can balance this? like? being a bit stubborn or being shiny object syndrome oriented yeah for sure so right so on one end of the spectrum you have this plan that you think is perfectly mapped out and it'll lead you to the exact end goal that you have in mind and you're like if i just stick to the path if i just stick to this plan then all of my dreams will come true right but then you have people on the other end of the spectrum who are like constantly going after the next thing that they think will make them successful quicker or make them more money faster or things like that and so where do we find that balance and that's exactly like the main point or the main thesis that I make in my book is that we are so focused on the path that we forget about the person walking that path and whether or not they're the type of person that succeeds and reaches the goals that we have in mind for our life. 
because I see many people who come into success but aren't necessarily prepared for that success. So then it all comes crumbling down and they don't handle it um, with grace and they don't handle it eloquently um, or, you know, then there's, uh, there's people who... The, the main point is I think that we focus too much on trying to get these certain things done that we forget that it takes a certain person to get those things done. And we don't build the type of person who gets the success and the achievements that we hope for our life. And so to strike a balance between following a path and chasing the next best thing, I find that one thing that you're in it not because of the money, not because of the success, not because of the accolades, but because you truly love doing it. And you don't care about how long it will take you to be successful. You don't care about if you get make a lot of money off of it or not. You don't care. Like You just want to get better at the craft. Um, and if you never got the opportunity as a kid to explore different interests and you need to do that as an adult, then please do that. Please try different things as an adult so then you can find that one thing that you're like, yeah, I actually just want to write and publish books because I love doing this. And ultimately, I'd love to become a best-selling author, but if I don't, I'm not going to be upset because I just like writing and I just like talking to people about this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you'll know that you did all your best and you did all you could, you put in the work and, you know, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and it's actually from one of my favorite podcasters and he's from your town as well. Okay. He's from Columbus, Lewis House. Hey, wait, Lewis House? The School of Greatness. Oh, I've never heard of that, but I'll look him up. Oh, you should look him up and you okay. should connect to him if you can because he's awesome like yeah i've been listening to him for i don't know maybe eight years something okay. like that that's he's awesome. very good and he was talking to bon jovi okay about about leadership about about everything really and actually I even forgot the point i was going to make because <laughs> that's i got okay. so excited about yes. talking about lewis because he's so cool <laughs> and i hope to have him on the show one, one time yes. or go That's to his so show cool. and I hope you go to his as well yeah anyways what were we talking about before this um, we were talking about like becoming the person focusing on becoming the person who gets the success oh yeah yeah basically it was about Bon Jovi talking about this and focusing as well on becoming the kind of person that that eventually gets to that level of success yeah, I'm definitely going to have to listen now, especially, man, he's from Columbus, too. It's kind of crazy once you realize where people are from. But also, I mean, you mentioned that you've been listening to him for eight years and eight like eight years later, he has had Bon Jovi on his podcast. Like in the grand scheme of things, eight years isn't a long time to work on something and to be maybe a beginner at something and then eight years fast forward on your podcast you know what I mean yeah, like I, a lot can happen in a short amount of time but it's not going to be a year that you go from starting a podcast to having freaking Bon Jovi on your podcast but I mean eight years in the grand scheme of things isn't that long yeah I mean to be fair when I first heard of him he hadn't just started he already had some good guests by that awesome. but yeah. anyways yeah eight years in the grand scheme of things like hopefully we're gonna live another 50 60 years at right. least so like time will pass 10 years will pass and then another 10 years will pass and if we're always thinking short term like how great can i be six months from now you'll never get to the level you want to because you're just too short-sighted if you're like that. and that i think there's a saying something along the lines of People overestimate what they can do in a year, mm -hmm. but they underestimate what they can do in a decade. And so because we are so short-sighted in success, if we're writing out our New Year's resolution, resolutions come January 1st, we're super ambitious. We think we can get all these things done in a year, but in actuality, we can't. And then we end up giving up a little bit longer and worked on it for a decade, then you can actually come into the type of success that you visualize for yourself. 
Yeah, definitely. And that's why I hate New Year's resolutions because <laughs> people try to think about that kind of thing only in the beginning of the year or mm -hmm. actually at the end of the year. And I think people should do this much more frequently. If for they sure. did, if they thought about it weekly, for instance, they'd achieve so much more. Mm -hmm. and it would be actually easier to achieve anything because just by writing it down and looking at it, every day or every other day like you have this on your subconscious you're always thinking about it some way so it's much mm -hmm. easier to achieve something when you and have even it right there. yeah looking back at it and reevaluating it and reassessing the goal and thinking hey does this goal still fit in my life yeah. does this goal still make sense for the bigger picture of what i want um and and making adjustments and saying hey like this goal might not exactly be what I need anymore, but how can I still work to elevate myself in my life um, and achieve the big picture dreams that I have for myself? So, I mean, just because, I don't know, I think reevaluating our goals more often um, is, is essential to actually reaching the goals that we want for our life. Yeah, it's about checking the game plan once in a while because when COVID hit, for instance, everyone had to re-evaluate everything mm -hmm. and you had a bunch of uncertainty you didn't mm -hmm. know. So if you are constantly checking the game plan and thinking, yeah, maybe this doesn't make sense anymore. Maybe I should change. Maybe this goal, I can just scrap it. And now this makes more sense. And like, yeah. Just by constantly, I mean, not like every day, all the time looking at it, because then you, you won't do anything. You <laughs> won't do the work. <laughs> once in a while, you reevaluate. Re yeah. You'll be able to steer the ship in the direction you actually want to go. Like, long yeah, term. exactly. Exactly. I think people would get too disappointed at themselves, too, if they don't reach a goal. And it's like, well, maybe it wasn't the fact that you couldn't reach the goal, and, but maybe it was the fact that the goal wasn't the right goal for you anyways. You know what I mean? So I, I you know, um, reevaluating your goals plays into that as well. Yeah, because sometimes it's not the person you want to become anyway. So mm -hmm. why bother with that yeah. goal specifically so much? Yeah, for sure. And it also goes back to the intangibles because you won't achieve everything you set out to. There's no way... Like, things happen and mm -hmm. you may have the best habits ever but one day you won't be able to go to the gym because of whatever and mm -hmm. that's okay you just need to keep that trend line going up you don't need to have like every day be your best day ever yeah and yeah. talking about best day ever what about if we talked about this dream day that you talk about in your book yeah so there, one thing that's important to me as an author is that I don't just get people motivated and inspired um, reading my book and get them temporarily excited and hyped up to make a change in their life, but that I give them tangible things that they can do to carry it out into their lives for the long run. And one of those things that I do in the book is called the Dream Day Activity. Detail what our dream day or our ideal day would look like. And so I prompt you with questions such as, what time do you wake up? What kind of bed do you wake up in? How do the sheets feel when you wake up? What's the first thing that you do? Do you go downstairs and you make yourself an espresso? Or do you read a little bit in your bed? Or do you wake up and go on a run? Like, we literally go through like every hour of the day and we detail what we want our lives to look like. Because I think that we have a vision of success in society, but that success isn't tailored to you. So it doesn't feel like something that you want to work towards. Um, and I talk about in my book how I have a friend who his dream house is a castle, 
right? And it's like everybody, I think, dreams about having a nice house, but not everybody dreams about living in a castle. And the type of person that it takes to get a castle versus the type of person that it takes to get the type of house that I want is different, right? And so really thinking specifically about the success that you want in your life and what success means to you allows you to align your thoughts, words, and actions today with that success that you see yourself having in the future. So it's really just about personalizing the success that you want for your life. So basically the more specific you make your goals, the more emotional connection you feel to them, the easier it will be to achieve them. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Did we lose connection? Oh, okay. Yeah, my connection. I think it had some fluctuation. Anyways, so the more specific the goals we have and the more emotional connection we have to them, the easier it will get be to get to them eventually. Exactly. Yeah. If we don't tie like um, our emotions, like you were saying, to our goals, then they won't feel like our goals and we won't feel like we have any reason to pursue them. Yeah, I think that's the great reason why so many people end up failing because the goals they set out to are things they think they should be doing or things they think that society kind of expects them to be doing. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that's true to them. Mm -hmm. So they end up not having that intrinsic motivation to actually go and do the things and work hard for years on end if they need to, to get sure. to that level of success. Yeah, yeah. And I think that you can feel a lot of pressure to make your life appear a certain way to other people because of expectations that you experience. Um, whether that's people saying, you know, you should do this or you should become an M NBA player because you're tall and you're really good at basketball, you know, that kind of thing. Or your parents having expectations of who you should be and what you should do. Um, it can be really hard to come to terms with the expectations that other people have of you um, and to have the courage to be like, that's not what I want for my life and that's not what I'm going to do with my life. Like having your own clear vision of what you want for your life and actually pursuing that. For sure, for sure. And can you guide us through your thought process and how was it when you were in your nine to five job and like you said, it was high paying and you had some perks mm -hmm. and in theory, you should be happy about it because mm -hmm. you were achieving a certain level of, of success quite young. But at the end of the day, you didn't really enjoy it because you kind of got bored because it didn't have enough challenge. And you knew deep down that you wanted to be an offer and that maybe if you didn't take that leap 10 years from now, you'd still be regretting it and thinking, what if? Mm -hmm. So how was that thought process? And how did you eventually gather the courage to just take the leap? Yeah, well, first things first, when I graduated high school, I never would have had the courage to tell the people around me that I wanted to be an author and that I wanted to write books because it's not a traditional career to have and it's not one that many people find success in. Like, it's there's no guaranteed um, monetary or financial gain from this and you need to have money like you you need to have money to survive right the expectation that was placed on me from my parents they expected my brother and I to go to college um, and to get a degree because that is the picture of success that was painted to them um, and so I went to college without even really questioning it because I just thought that's what everybody did um, and once I graduated I was fortunate enough to get a job right out of graduation, which is is not typical, hard in America today. Um, but I got that job and I started working in corporate America at 21 years old because I graduated college early. So at 21, I was in corporate America and I recognized the blessing that this job was. Um, I got 
you know, compensated fairly. I worked in a good environment. I had a boss who was kind of hands off. He let me do my work. He let me, you know, learn and do my best work. He didn't micromanage me or anything like that. Um, but deep down, I knew that this is not what I wanted my life to look like, that I had curated my life to the expectations of other people and what they thought success is. Um, but working a corporate nine to five job for, you know, 50 years and, and, you know, going up the ladder is not my definition of success, but I had to first admit that to myself. Um, because if you don't admit to yourself what you really want in your life, you're never actually going to get there. And before you start telling other people, you have to tell yourself and be honest with yourself, right? And so um, I had to be honest with myself about the type of success that I wanted for my life. And then I figured that the, the longer I sat on the idea of success for my life, the less likely it was going to come true. Okay, I want to be an author but I didn't actually start taking the steps to be an author, I would never actually become one. So I knew that I would have to take the risk as soon as possible to make this a reality um, so then I can start actually curating my life and the success that I have to be what I want it to be and not what anybody else wants it to be or what anybody else expects of me. And so that, that was really hard to not only have the courage to express to other people that this is not what I want my life to look like and to seemingly give up a good job and a safe job to pursue something that has no guarantee of success. Um, but I'm much happier this way. And I don't care that I'm not making as much money because I feel fulfilled doing this. And that's what I want on my deathbed is who cares about the money? You're not going to have it forever, but you only have one life and you have one chance to feel fulfilled and make your life worth living. That was such a banger, Jade. <laughs> Thanks. No, really, because, yeah, that's something I always question people. When you're old and you're in your deathbed, like, you won't regret, like, oh, I should have done more, like, extra work, extra hours. Mm -hmm. I should have stayed at the office longer. The only people who will remember that are your partner and your children. Mm -hmm. And you'll be thinking, wow, I should have traveled with my son more. I should have given them more attention. Now no one wants to be here with me. That kind mm -hmm. of thing. You won't think about, you'll think like, why shouldn't I, why didn't I ask that girl out? Why didn't I mm -hmm. take that other job? Why didn't I take that leave? Why didn't I travel somewhere? Like you're, you're not going to think about the things that we are conditioned to think that are the successful way or the things that mm -hmm. are meaningful. And at the end of the day, I think one of the main things in your book is that everything has to be meaningful to you. It shouldn't be something that you're conditioned to think is meaningful. It needs to be more intrinsic. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is I mentioned a quote in my book by a famous philosopher named Seneca and it essentially it talks about death and how we think that death is something that comes in the future but rather death is something that has already happened because the time that we've already lived and the time that is passing is owned by death itself and the thing is, is I'm not trying to, death can be a very scary thing to talk about because it's unknown and it's something that we all face. Um, but the thing is, is you don't know when your life is going to end. And I think people logically know this, but we don't live our lives as if it's true. And I recently experienced the sudden and tragic death of my uncle. And he passed away at 40 years old, 40 years old, his whole life ahead of him. And it's like, you seriously do not know when your last day is. So why would you waste it sitting in an office doing work that you don't want to do? Why would you waste it hiding who your true self is and what you really want for your life? And I understand that it is way more complicated than that. And there are some people who do not have the privilege of being their full selves and are not in an environment where they can actually do that. But 
there is a way for us to still foster the life that we actually want to live and be doing the things that we want to do. Because here's the thing, I frequently ask myself, if I were to, if I were to die today, would I be happy? And the answer is yes. Have I made the type of money that I want to make? No. Have I had kids? No. Have I gotten married? No. But am I satisfied with where my die today? Would I be okay with that? Yes. Because I am working towards and I am living a life that is fulfilling to me. You know, Steve Jobs used to say something like that. He did? That, yeah, like if you have too many days in a row in which the answer to that question would be no, mm. then you should rethink your life because something's wrong yeah yeah i did not know that steve jobs talked about that but yeah i mean i don't want to sound mor morbid and i don't think about death that often but i do ask myself that question and it's a good reality excuse me it's a good reality check for me and being like are the things that i'm doing and the ways that i'm spending my time leading to a fulfilling life for me yeah I kind of do that all the time to people around me. Like sometimes I feel like they don't have that sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, oh my God, please, you're not yeah. gonna live forever. Like, yeah. just do it. Like, yeah. just go. You know. And sometimes it's hard for me. I try to help people sometimes, but sometimes they don't want to be helped. I guess. Yeah, and that's hard too. Is when you see someone else's potential for their life. And you're like, oh my gosh, like you, you're wasting it. You're wasting it, please. Like, it's not going to be easy. And it's not like, but it'll be worth it. You know, that kind of thing. Just try. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, actually thinking about death actually leads to a more purposeful, li purposeful life. I'm yeah. not sure if it was Bhutan or what country, like one tiny country. And they think about death like seven times a day something like well, that okay and they are among the happiest people in the whole world because really? i guess by thinking about it you kind of tend to gravitate towards am i living a purposeful life am i doing what i should be doing and and then you just go and do it Mm -hmm. well, that's the things I saw a video and it was something along the lines of how long we spend on social media and how many days that adds up to in a year and it was like something around we spend like a hundred days straight Cons wow. I know that's a third of the year consuming social media and like you know watching TikTok or whatever and if we were to really question death and kind of think about it more often if we were and we thought about death and the fact that we could die tomorrow, I bet you'd put your phone down. I'd bet you'd yeah, maybe, get off of TikTok. You know what I mean? Maybe we should do death TikToks, like talking yeah, about that kind of thing. Right? Get, get out of the here. algorithm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the algorithm wouldn't push it. So. No, no. They'd be like, what? They're trying to get people off of TikTok? That's not what we want. Yeah, but it's even crazier because it's not even a third of the year because you're sleeping. In theory, you should be uh -huh. sleeping about a third of the time anyway, so it's I know. even more. It's I ridiculous. Know. Like, yeah, like the we time, we have so much, we already live a short life, but then we sleep a lot of it, and then we spend a lot of it entertaining. So it's like, we really don't live a lot of our lives, <laughs> like just point blank. And so, yeah, I don't know. Just something for people to keep in mind and to reflect and revisit so then they can check in with themselves if they're living the life that they want to for sure yeah but i think because most people don't think about it that way it's actually quite easy to the word in english I'm, i forgot That's okay. it right now <laughs> so it's it's easy to get ahead of most people because most people are just they're scrolling around tiktok or whatever and mm -hmm. and they if you put one or two hours a day and most people can. I don't know. Some people can't because they have to work. Yes, of of I know that kind mm -hmm. of thing. But for most people that might be listening to this, you reasonably can take out one hour or two every day. And like you say in your book as well, like you can, maybe you can wake up a little earlier or go to sleep a bit later, whatever it is. But you can carve out one hour or two to work on yourself or work on the dreams you really want to achieve or the things that are really meaningful to you for sure but 
sometimes we end up as well in a situation in which we get so drained by our, our environment that mm -hmm. we only can lie down and scroll social media or mm -hmm. watch Netflix and how do you get out of that kind of situation? And that's exactly um, how I felt in May of 2020. It was probably the saddest period of my life and I was really not liking my job and I felt very purposeless and feeling very purposeless is a very sad thing and it's a very draining thing. Everybody wants to feel like they have a purpose, a reason why they're alive, right? And a reason why they were put on this earth. So May of 2020, say 2020. I think it was May of 2020. I think but it was in the May book, of you said 23, but anyways. <laughs> okay, I think it was May of 2023, yes. All, again, the dates are going to get messed up. So almost a year ago now, um, I was in that place where I would, you know, I would wake up 10 minutes before I had to leave for work. I would get dressed really quickly, then I would go drive to work, and then I would be at work. I would kind of like zombie my way through the day, and I would go straight to bed because I was so sad. I didn't know what to do with my time. I didn't know what to do with my life. Um, and so I just try, I had a very bad coping mechanism and that coping mechanism was just going to sleep because then, then I didn't have to think about it. Right. Um, but I started to realize that like, a, this is not what I want my life to be like. Um, and B, I'm the only one who can change this, right? Like I had a significant other at the time and it's like, he couldn't change it for me. My family, they're super supportive. They couldn't change it for me. I had to be the one to want to make a change in my life. So when I was so, when I was down bad, I had to lean on the truths that I knew about myself. And one of those truths is that I'm a checklist girl. I love checklists. I make a checklist every single day and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do today. I love marking things off a checklist. Like that is just I'm going to make a checklist of what I have to get done every day just to survive. Like I'm going to put, eat breakfast, get ready, take a shower, eat dinner, like these very basic things that I was not able to get myself to do, I made a checklist and I started doing that every single day because I knew that that would be something that I could lean on and that would sort of motivate me to make a change in my life. Dramatic changes in their lives in order to become a better version of themselves or to find the success that they're looking for, but really you just need to take the small steps. And for me, the small steps at that time looked like making sure that I ate three meals a day and making sure that I took a shower and making sure that I just did these very basic survival things. And that's what allowed me to continue to build on it, build on it, build on it. And then six months later, write a book, you know? Yeah. Talk about an exponential growth. <laughs> yeah, for real, for real. Yeah. I think gamifying your life has... Mm -hmm so much potential to help you like, yeah little by little we like you said a few minutes ago like in one year we tend to overestimate and in a decade we tend to underestimate and in this case maybe in one month you may overestimate but six months down the line you wrote a book so yeah you went exactly. from being at the proverbial gutter uh -huh. in your life to being like at the top so this is and that's, very interesting. That's what I yeah. wish more people understood because depression runs in my family and there's a lot of members of my family who really struggle with seeing how their lives can turn around and how things can get better and how they can be happy. And although I've never been formally diagnosed with depression myself, I have experienced bouts of, I call it extreme sadness, and I've lived with people who experience depression, so I, I see secondhand what it does to their lives, um, but I, I wish more people could understand that you really can go from the gutters to one of the greatest accomplishments in your life in a span of six months. Like that, your life can turn around and your life has purpose and your life has hope. And there's a reason why you're on this earth and you were made to do great things. And you just have to find that day. And you mentioned earlier that it's not about putting in 100% every day. It's about putting in at least 1% every day. <laughs> like, do you, just because writing is 
is a passion of mine. Do you think I want to write every day? Heck no. Like, are you kidding me? But I still force myself like, hey, even if I don't feel like writing today, I'm going to write one sentence. I'm going to write one paragraph. You know what I mean? And if I can't give it, give my 100%, that's okay. I and, and do that every single day. Yeah, I think to people that have that kind of situation, the main thing is believing. You need to believe in mm -hmm. yourself. You need to believe that you can get out of it. Because if mm -hmm. you don't, you won't anyways. Yeah. And about that 1% every day, I think that's also a fundamental core belief that you must have. Mm -hmm. that you might not have the best day possible, but at least you try to. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there will be days in which you will have 200, 300% because you're inspired, you're motivated, mm -hmm. you had the perfect breakfast or whatever yeah. it is that day you have that special day. And yeah. that's when you use it. It's all about energy management as well, because yeah. you will have days in which you're a bit down and you have to manage so that when you're especially on the upper side as well, you can use it the best way possible. Yes, and you can take advantage when you do have that energy and that motivation. You can really try to get as many things done as possible. But then also, if you don't have that um, energy and that motivation, what do you fall back on and how do you continue to progress forward, even if just in the slightest way? Yeah, and I know you talk about becoming a robot in your book <laughs> yeah. and being a systems girl. Yeah, And I think this has to do with systems as well because at the end of the day, you end up falling back on your habits or your systems. Yeah. So sometimes even if you don't have the best day possible, but at least you're so ingrained into your system that you end mm -hmm. up having a reasonable day. So even the worst days end up being better than they would be otherwise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. And talking about this, why should we be a robot? Yeah, so... I have a section in my book talking about the perks of being a robot or becoming a robot and uh, this really stemmed from my love of rowing on the rowing or the erg machine. That was a recent um, exercise discovery I had made when I was writing this book. Because I've no I haven't always known that I liked rowing, but there was a rowing machine in the gym that I went to, so I was like, hmm, let me give it a try. And I ended up loving it. Robot manner where you're just like, you can zone out and go forever, you know, in that motion. And I realized that like there are so many perks to systemizing our lives in a way that allows us to fall back on those systems when we are having a bad day or when we're not motivated or when, you know, we're sad or anxiety is high or whatever. You can fall back on those systems and still be able to make some progress forward rather than everything going to shambles when you feel a certain way. Because I think that a lot of people rely on feelings to get them through to like, oh, I feel motivated, so I'm going to put in the work. Um, but feelings are temporary. Um, I actually, I do speaking events at high schools and colleges, and I had one high school student ask me, she was like, how are you so motivated all the time? I'm like, girl, I am never motivated. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, if I relied on motivation to get me to where I wanted to be, it take me 20 times longer to get to the end goal because I rarely feel motivated. I told her, I was like, I'm motivated maybe 10% of the time. The rest of that 90% is the discipline and the habits and the systems that I built for my life, right? And so that's why I talk about being a robot in the sense of what are some things that you can automate in your life to ensure that you have something to fall back on um, when life isn't <laughs> when life is really working against you sometimes. You know, when you talk about this, you come across as having a very logical outlook. <laughs> and especially when you talk about emotions, and I totally agree with you that if we rely on our emotions, it's usually detrimental to where we want to go. Mm -hmm. But do you think you were always like that? Or do you think it has to do with how your father brought you up with all of those questions? Yeah, there's many things. I am a very emotional person, like just naturally. I'm very emotional. Um, but because of the way that I was raised, I also have that very logical side of me. So I often find my emotions and my logic really battling against each other. So I've had to learn um, that balance in my own life and try to figure out 
um, how to validate my own emotions and be okay with the logic completely take over, um, but also kind of not, not letting the emotions completely take over and rule my life. And I think that that is a balance that everybody has to work through um, in their lives and as they experience different things. And it's, it's a constant, I, I'm not perfect at it. I haven't, I haven't learned it completely and I don't practice or execute it perfectly every time. You know what I mean? So it's, it's just a constant thing that we have to be working on, experience emotion. And do you have any tips to people that are also very emotional and how to deal with it? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is that like, I think some studies have shown that an emotion lasts for 90 seconds and whatever you feel after those 90 seconds is whatever you're replaying in your brain. Mm -hmm. So be conscious of the things that you're replaying in your brain because that's often where the lasting feeling of like, if you're, um, yesterday actually, <laughs> my little brother and I work at the same coffee shop, okay? And we are really close, but sometimes we'll get annoyed with each other when we're working together. Yesterday was a prime example of that. And we had gotten annoyed at each other and it, it impacted the rest of the time that we were working together. The, le the rest of the four hours that we were working together, we were annoyed at each other. And I had to remind myself, it's like, the feeling of annoyance at towards my little brother lasted for 90 seconds. Four hours was because I kept replaying the situation in my head over again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So just be conscious of what you're replaying in your head um, and, and try to ground yourself and remind yourself that these emotions aren't going to last forever um, and it's not an indication of like who you are as a person. And do you think it's harder when we're dealing with people that we love or that we have this deeper connection like in this case with your brother mm -hmm. of course of course like the people that i love the most in my life are also the people that get on my nerves the most in my life you know what i mean that's what it is because you just you get to know those people so well um and they act themselves like completely themselves around you because there's just some things my little brother does around me that i know he wouldn't do around anybody else you know what i mean so mm -hmm. it's like sometimes it's like bro why would you do that you wouldn't do that around your friends or something like that but that's just um it's an indication that you guys are close and that there's a good bond there so it's not necessarily a bad thing it's just how we gotta how we receive it and how we choose to let it impact our mood and and our actions going forward yeah and thinking about this as well like we were talking about when sometimes we see that someone isn't using their potential as well as they could mm -hmm. and i think when it's people that we love or people that are very close to us yeah. both friends or relatives i think it's much harder to that feeling is much more intense like yeah if you were dealing with a coaching client for instance it would be much easier to separate the layers and yeah. to give them good feedback i think that we can take it personal and be like but i know you have potential so how do you not see your own potential you know that kind of thing um and especially with like family members we can often see a part of ourselves in that person like mm -hmm. you see a part of yourself in your mom or a part of yourself in your dad or your siblings so it's like when you see that they aren't reaching their full potential you can really take it personal um, in that sense as well so and it is it is hard but that I've had to learn in life is if someone themselves do not want to change they're not going to change you're not going to be able to force them or make them change yeah you just have to suck it up and keep suffering with it. And <laughs> Suppo supporting them as, as much as you can, yeah, in the ways that'll help them the most, yeah, for sure. And going back to the times that you have speaking gigs at, uh, at high schools, that yeah. kind of thing, how was your first one and what do you typically talk about to those kids? Yeah, so my first one was hard. I was super nervous. I still get very nervous at the beginning of all my speaking engagements. Um, but after a few minutes, I usually relax into it, kind of get into my groove. Um, so it's okay if you still feel nervous about doing things. That's not an indication of 
you know, if you're good or you're bad or you did well or not, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I usually talk about things, um, cause I speak to mostly juniors and seniors at high school. So they're really thinking about their future and what they want for their lives after school. Um, so I tend to talk a lot actually about decision making because a lot of them have a hard time making decisions for their life and the direction of their life because often at graduating high school is the first time that you get to start making decisions about what direction you want your life to go. So a lot of, I find myself a lot talking about um, how to make good decisions. Um, but I also think that I'm in a very unique position where I'm only like five or six, well, probably more like six or seven years older than these kids. So I'm not much older than them. So I can give them um, an insight into what their life could look like soon. You know what I mean? Because like when you talk to your parents who are like 40, 50, 60 years old, where there's like a 30 year age gap, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really resonate as much. But if they can talk to someone who's only like, cause I graduated high school in 2019, so only barely five years ago, if they can talk to someone who's only five years removed from high school, then they can kind of get a better image of being like, okay, this is how I work towards what I want. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. They think I could be that girl. They yeah. don't. They wouldn't think that way if it was a 60-year-old guy talking to them. Yeah, because it, 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 they know and they acknowledge that that person has lived and experienced so much more of their lives. And, it, and they're like, yeah, I can be that person 60 years from now, right? But if they see me, who's a little bit closer in age to them, then they're like, yeah, I can be that person a few years from now. Like, I can do what she does, you know? Yeah, and also the world is so different from how it was back then. So yes. you really have a very similar outlook to theirs. So it's yeah. much easier as well to resonate. For sure, for sure. And then I can talk about, you know, the trends in social media and things like that and, and instantly create a bond with them. <laughs> and I could be like, what's up, brother? <laughs> Whatever that. Have you seen that guy who does the streaming online? He's recently no. blown up. Oh, okay, there's this guy who's recently blown up in the streaming world and he always goes like Tuesday, Tuesday, what up brothers, you know, that kind of thing, like that's his slogan. So like all the high school kids are saying it now nowadays and so it's like I can resonate with like the media that they consume and things like that too. So you always start with Tuesday, <laughs> no, Tuesday? No, no, <laughs> definitely not, <laughs> definitely not, but it is, it is funny though. So. Uh, how do you begin your your speaking arrangements? Like, hey, I'm yeah. Jade. How is it? Usually, I like to start with um, kind of a history of the things that I've gone through since graduating high school. Because what I didn't realize as a high schooler is that your life can change so much from year to year. Because up until like when you're a senior in high school, you've been attending school and basically doing the same thing the past 15 years in a row. You know what I mean? Like there might be some changes from going from primary school to high school. You know what I mean? Like obviously those are different and there's a change there, but you're just going to school every year. Um, and so I usually like to start my presentation with giving them a bit of what has happened in my life in the past year and be like, or the past five years and be like, guys, five years ago I was sitting in your seat and I could have never imagined that I graduated college in three years. I, exp I experienced a worldwide pandemic. I started and ended an Etsy shop business. I moved to a different state. I worked a nine to five. I quit that nine to five and then I wrote a book. Did all that in five years? And you're like, holy crap, I didn't know that much could happen in five years because the past 15 years, I've just been going to school. You know what I mean? I just don't think that kids these days realize how much your life changes and can change on a year to year basis because of that. So I usually like to start my speaking engagements with a little bit of, you know, pictures of what has happened in my life since I've graduated high school. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to instill into them because, yeah, you're right. Think about six months ago and how much has changed and how much will change in the next six months as well. So Exactly. And yeah, like you said, when you are in school and also if you are at a nine to five many times, mm 
Mm-hmm. It's, sometimes it might feel like you're always living the same day, like that yeah. movie Groundhog Day. Yes, yes, and, I love that movie. Yeah. And then 20 years go by, and you're wondering what happened. Yes. What happened is that you were living the same day, so that's why they seem like just a flash. You know? Right. Exactly. Also, like that movie Click as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen that one too. Yeah. Is it that, yeah, that has so, Adam Sandler in it, right? Yeah, yeah. With, yeah, with I love Adam Sandler. Remote control and yeah, yeah, yeah. He's one he of my favorite actors. Tries to skip actors. some parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to skip some parts of my life too, but that's not how it works. Yeah, and sometimes it wouldn't be the best thing actually. Yes. Like, there are lessons to learn even in the times we want to skip. Of course, yeah, yeah. You just got to be open to them. Yes. And what else do you teach those kids? Oh man. Um the most recent talk that I did, so there's like two forms of talks that I do. I'll either do like a large auditorium where I'm talking to a couple hundred kids at one time or I will go into a classroom and I'll talk to every class period that comes through. Um, And I prefer the second way because I talk to a smaller group of kids, I get to know them and their personalities a little bit more. Um, But a lot of times we um, kind of diverge from what I had planned to talk to them about to talk about the things that are on their minds and to talk about the things that are worrying them and that they're unsure of and don't know about. So I really try to take advantage of, you know, if they have questions about this or about that, then we'll dive into that and ditch what I had planned um, to make it the most valuable um, to what can impact their lives now. And I tell them, like, I'm not naive. I know that by the time you know, that Monday rolls around, you're going to forget everything that I said. Like, I know that a lot of it is going in one ear and out the other. But if you guys can just take today to really think about and internalize the things that we've talked about, I think that'll have a positive impact on your life. Um, And I think that that really... Um, kind of de-armors them and opens them, themselves up to the possibility of being like, A, I don't have to remember everything that this lady is talking about, right? Um, but B, even if it just impacts me for today and even if it just allows me to have a different perspective on life and think about things differently, um, then that can help direct you know, their days afterwards and their lives and perspectives afterwards. And do you ever tell them the first class story? The, the wait which one when you got into the first class for the first time on a plane the oh yeah okay um have i i actually think that i have mentioned that story before um because like i think that a lot of kids surprising i mean maybe not surprisingly but a lot of kids these days they like want to be influencers and they want to be youtubers and they want to be social media people um and so i think that along with that comes a certain lifestyle and i think that people really want that lifestyle more than they maybe want the actual job of it right Mm -hmm. and that was um kind of the whole like foundation of telling the whole the first class story of a lot of people want to be able to fly first class and want to be able to you know fly whenever they want or have money to travel a lot and all these different things but they don't want to put in the effort that it takes to get there you know what I mean and they don't want to live a life that is worthy of being someone who has the money to be able to fly first class you know what I mean and so I think what a lot of people or a lot of what I see of the younger generation, and I mean even my generation, um, is the fact that we're striving to towards a certain lifestyle rather than striving towards, you know, fulfillment and purpose and success in that in that way. Yeah, and do you think we how could we teach them or show them the right path that you shouldn't be striving for the accolades or for the objects themselves because they're they aren't a means they're just a means they're not mm-hmm. an end mm-hmm. so like you said you need to become the first class person at the end of the day because otherwise you might be there and like in your book when you tell your story it was kind of like yeah I, i'm flying first class but i kind of don't feel like i should be or mm-hmm. kind of feels like i don't deserve it for some yeah. reason so exactly. how can we make these like 
thinking about the Venn diagrams, how can we make the current self and the future self come together so that when we actually get there, we feel like we deserve it and we don't feel that imposter syndrome? I think that there are two things that we can do slash that need to happen. The first thing is I think people need to experience striving for success and then getting that success and then the resulting feelings. Because I think that we rely on success and be like, okay, once I publish my first book, then I'm going to feel good about myself. Then I'm going to have confidence in who I am. Then I'm going to feel like I'm going to have purpose. And then you publish a book and you're like, oh, my confidence doesn't come from that. My purpose doesn't come from that. You know what I mean? Like you, you're kind of left with an empty feeling sometimes after achieving these great things. And I think that we do need to experience that empty feeling to realize that your purpose in life and what makes you feel fulfilled is not necessarily those accolades or those things that we're achieving towards. Um, so I do think that more than telling students that or telling the younger generations or whatever, that they probably need to experience it themselves and learn, um, you know. Um, but the other thing on the imposter syndrome side is I think it's important to have a... I don't want to say this. I think it is important to have a larger-than-life sense of self and to be able to believe in yourself so much to be like, yes, um, I can achieve these things and I can do these things um, because it's way more efficient and it's a way better way to live your life than to have that opposite perspective, which is I can't do anything and my life is it doesn't amount to anything and all that stuff. So I would say those are probably the, the t but there's always going to be a side of us who's a side of who we are that's trying to strive for those accolades because that's what society tells us is success and that is what society defines your worth on yeah i agree with you that you should reach for the stars even if it's unreasonable because otherwise mm -hmm. you'll be too you will pick two easy goals mm -hmm. and they won't be enough to motivate you to put in the work anyway mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's more about, like you say a lot in your book as well, it's more about being that person and not the things themselves. Because, okay, maybe imagine tomorrow you wake up with $10 million in your bank account. Now what? Right. Now you have everything. Now imagine, oh, you want the relationship. Okay, now you have it. Now what? Right. Like, you'll always be... Mm -hmm. thinking about something else so now I want the Lamborghini okay now you have one so what like yeah it, it has to come from within it's yeah. not something external that it's it also has to do with motivation like intrinsic motivation or not I think yeah exactly I mean we're we're always going to be striving towards that next goal and I definitely really struggle with that and I made an Instagram post about it recently where I had to intentionally make sure that I was celebrating me publishing this this book because pretty much as soon as I hit publish, I was like, okay, what's the next goal that I need to be working towards, right? Like I never even took a break to be like, okay, I freaking published a book and like, let's celebrate that a little bit. You know what I mean? So again, I think it's just how society functions and we're always constantly trying to reach that next goal, but we're not necessarily going to find fulfillment in that next goal. So you have to be able to um, intrinsically figure out what that um, fulfillment looks like to you and, and be able to, again, on your deathbed, be like, it didn't matter that I got $10 million. It didn't matter that I got the Lambo, like all these different things. Like what mattered is that um, I was able to be my true self and I accepted myself. Um, I saw this study that, and I, I mean, I should probably quote these studies better than I do, but I saw this study that was about how people who accept themselves end up living a happier life and end up living a longer life simply because they accept who they are fully. And so it's like, maybe we should be focusing more on that than any of the accolades and any of the financial success and things like that, so. Yeah, I think many times we think that we need to be something else other than ourselves to try to impress someone. Or... And at the end of the day, we end up teaching ourselves that we aren't enough, that yeah. what we already have, like the person we already are isn't enough. And I think you even mentioned this in the book that 
you end up attracting people that don't like you for who you are because you're always putting a mask on and yeah. trying to be something else. So exactly. you end up attracting people that like the mask, but they don't mm -hmm. like who you really are. And then you show them who you are and then they don't like that. And yeah. you're always on the hamster wheel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about your nine to five, even though I know you kind of hated it, but there of were course. some good parts as well. Yeah. You got to travel a little bit. So how was it? Talk about the whole process, like getting in and the good parts. Let's not think about the bad parts. Yeah, like of course. Traveling and what did you do when you were traveling? All that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So one thing that I think people should capitalize more on, especially young adults, is the connections that you have and the connections that you're making and to constantly be telling people what you want to do with your life because you never know if those people have the skills or the ability to get you to where you want to go. You know what I mean? And so one of the most valuable things that came after graduating college was I was suddenly a part of an alumni network of a bunch of people who had attended the same university that I went to. And that's exactly how I got my first job. It wasn't the fact that I had applied and interviewed for hundreds of jobs, which I was doing that too. But the person who was hiring at this company had attended my university. And so we were already Already in some of the same social circles and when he reached out to me he was like hey I attended because I, I graduated from Miami University of Ohio and he's like hey I went to Miami um, you know I graduated and blah 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 I got this degree we're hiring would you like to interview for the position I was like okay cool yeah why not um, so really just take advantage of the network that you have and build bridges with people um, and continue to foster the relationships that you have had in the past. Like I continue to reach out to old teachers that I had, just staying in touch with people because you never know how that relationship can kind of help you get to the next stepping stone in your, in your career and things like that. Um, but anyways, I worked this job in Renewable Energy and it was an international company, which was an awesome opportunity because then I had international coworkers and I got the ability to travel internationally. So if you hope to travel as part of your job, then I would definitely recommend trying to company because that will kind of increase your odds of being able to travel. Um, but also as, as part of my job is I would travel every other week to rural towns or like the countryside of America to meet with farmers because we would lease out or rent their land to be able to do these renewable energy projects on, right? So in order to build all these wind turbines or these solar panels, you gotta have the land to do that. And so I would negotiate these contracts with the landowners and get to know about you know, their, their way of life. And it was so interesting as someone who grew up in a suburb um, and you know was close to Columbus, Ohio, which is the capital city of Ohio, um, to learn how other people live and to learn how farmers live and ranchers and, and how they um, get a lot of their needs from the earth and, and they tend to and care for the earth and things like that. So it was very interesting to learn a different um, way of living from people like that. And it, it provided for really good conversations and, and perspectives that I had never thought about. So that was, that was a very good part of the job. Um, but other than that, it was just making sure that these projects, they require a lot of permitting and studies. You have to understand how is this project going to impact the, the earth? How is it going to impact the wildlife and change the structure of the landscape? And you have to do all these studies to try to figure this out and understand, is it smart to build a 50 megawatt solar farm? on this piece of land like is it safe for the animals that raise in the the lakes and the streams that go about this land like all these different things so i helped facilitate all of those studies to make sure that the construction of such large industrial projects like that would be feasible in areas um, that we were looking at so that's awesome like i love energy and renewable energy in particular yeah well, I guess most people don't know, but I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, so okay. the 
the things, the subjects that I most liked were the ones that revolved about energy. Yeah. And did you always have that kind of concern about the environment? Because it was one of the things you picked to study in college. Mm -hmm. So did little Jade, that same girl that liked to read a lot, have that concern already? Yeah, she she really cared about the earth and the future of our earth and our environment um, because I... I like to say I was raised in the local Boy Scout troop because my dad was on the committee chair for our local Boy Scout troop, so he was constantly involved in going to the campouts and, you know, go attending the meetings with the boys, and so I would always tag along. And so I learned the in the natural resources that we have, um, not only just for providing us food and minerals and all these different things but also just like emotional um the emotional connection that we have with nature and things like that so i always grew up learning about and being involved and surrounded by nature and so i think that's really what prompted me to major in environmental sustainability when i got to college and then thus working in renewable energy and do you think that that experience with the boy scouts helped in shaping you as a natural leader with your cousins and your brother? <laughs> I think what shaped me the most being a leader was just the pure fact that I was the oldest. I think that there's this thing called like um, oldest daughter syndrome where they're just like the natural born leaders and they're like delegating and you know helping advise people and things like that and I definitely fall into that category of being the first born daughter and being the oldest cousin and, and grandchild and things like that I just always was naturally this responsibility said hey you're the oldest so you gotta lead them you know that kind of thing so I think that was the biggest contributor to to my being a leader yeah I think Many people don't actually think about this, most people probably, but the order in which you're born into a family makes a total difference in yeah. shaping who you're going to become. Yeah. What order are you, if you don't mind me asking? I am, I am the same as you. I'm also okay. the, the oldest of everyone, like the first in the generation. Okay. By a landslide, so I always had that. I need to be the leader kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or I need to be like the role model for everybody else. Yeah, and I need to yeah. make sure that I'm being, that I'm doing the good things and the right things so then they can see how they should be as well. Yeah, and then that kind of gets, it. getting back to that, like trying to be the go-getter, the mm -hmm. A student, like the role model and everything. And yeah. eventually one day you might wake up and think, yeah, but that's not what I actually want to do. I want to do other things. Yeah. And then you try to get back to your former passions. When you were younger, like, if I didn't have that responsibility, what else would I want to do? And, mm -hmm. and or then those you decide kind of expectations. to become a writer yeah. or a yeah. ballet dancer or whatever. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. exactly. And I know you came to my country, to Brazil, while you were working. And how was that? Yes, okay. So it was the first international travel experience I had ever had. And I was just explaining how the to try to get down to Brazil from Washington, D.C., we had like three or four layovers in the process to try to find uh, arrive to our final destination. But I was super excited to experience the food of Brazil. I had heard lots of great things about your guys' beef in particular and just the different types of fruit that you guys have and how fresh it is and things like that. So I was really excited because um, I don't think that America is known for having good food. So I wanted no, to. No, definitely not. So I know that I don't consume natural like probably the best food so I was excited to experience the food um, but also try to understand like what was life like for my co-workers who we essentially did similar jobs but I was still in South America right and how does that impact um, their lives and as we were I think we took like a big bus around the city of I think it was Sao Paulo but it was so long ago that I can't remember but at the time that we traveled there, it was like an election, I believe, in September of like 2020. There was an election happening. 
So I got to see kind of like the politics of Brazil and how people were advocating for, you know, this person versus this person and the signs in the city and, uh, you know, what was going on TV and how people were perceiving this election. Because I think that it was a big election, but I can't remember what it was for or yeah, who it was, was between. For the president. It was for the president? Yeah, yeah. It was right before the, the first round. Okay, okay. Because then the second round is with the two top. Okay, and when like does the, the two second... Leaders in the, the first round is usually the first Sunday uh, in October, and then the last Sunday in October is the second round. Oh, shoot, okay. So, yeah, I was right when they were campaigning for, you know, the, the office position that they were running for. So also trying to understand, like, the politics and what was happening was very interesting to me. Um, but overall, just, I mean, like, here's the thing. It's not typical. <laughs> this is also something that I remember, something completely random. It's not typical in America to um, get bubbly water at, like, restaurants and mm -hmm. things like that. Like, we just get straight-up water, not the bubbly water. And so every time I went to a restaurant and got bubbly water, I was like, ew, I don't really like bubbly water. <laughs> like, it's just not something that I'm used to. Or, like, the late dinners. Like, we were eating dinner, like, from 8 p.m. to, like, 11 o'clock at night or something like that. And so those, those like, just little differences in culture is really fun to experience. Yeah, you should go to Argentina sometime because they have dinner at like 10, 11 p.m. Oh my gosh, that is crazy. That is crazy. And then also, I took Spanish classes in high school and college, so I knew a bit of Spanish. And I always thought that Spanish and Portuguese were closer than they are, but they're completely different. And I could not understand a thing in Brazil. So that, that was my own ignorance and misbelief that there was similarity between the languages, but they are not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are similar enough that it's easy to learn, especially when you go from Portuguese to Spanish, it's easy. Okay. Because we have more sounds. So okay. in Spanish, there are things that we, we are used to saying that they can't even really hear it because mm. they're not used to the sounds we make. Okay. But we know all of the sounds that they make, so for us it's easier to learn Spanish mm. than the other Okay, way so you would say it's easier to go from Portuguese to Spanish than it is from Spanish to Portuguese. Yeah. Okay, that's probably why, because my brain was just more wired to understand Spanish than it was to understand Portuguese, so the connection between the two was just not there for me. Yeah, it is, and many people have this like they think that it will be easier than it actually is mm -hmm. and usually when we go to one of our neighbors mm -hmm. like the other countries many brazilian tourists are a bit obnoxious and they try to speak portuguese but the people there won't understand yeah, yeah. So they're like the brazilian karens yeah <laughs> that's funny that's funny have you ever traveled internationally before yeah yeah i have like quite a lot actually yeah where have you been <laughs> I've been to America. I've lived in Germany for a while, so oh, okay. like pretty much the whole of Europe and wow. a little bit in South America as well. Okay. That's awesome. I haven't been able to get over to Europe yet. I do hope to one day because um, I know like and that's the thing is when I go there, I want to be able to be there for a long time because I want to be able to hit as many mm -hmm. countries as I can. Um, but I have a, a friend in particular who's from Luxembourg. Um, and she specifically speaks so many languages because Luxembourgish is just like a hodgepodge of, you know, German and all yeah. these different things. Like she knows how to speak French, English, Luxembourgish, German, like all these different things. I'm like, whoa, holy cow, girl is crazy. Yeah, especially because Luxembourg is such a small country as well. Yeah. So you yeah. are kind of and it's squished between Germany and France. Yes. And exactly. no one's going to learn Luxembourgish anyway. Right. <laughs> So you have to, you know, the, the Dutch are also famous for speaking very good English because no one's going to learn Dutch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even in Poland, they quite like the younger generations kind of speak good English because they know like they don't expect you to learn Polish anyway. Yeah, yeah. And that's I mean, that's what kind of sucks about some of these things being mainstream is like when you're from an English speaking country nobody feels that there's any importance in learning another language because everybody else is just learning English. You know what I mean? 
So there's really no point in trying to learn, you know, maybe Spanish. Spanish is probably the most practical language that we can learn as English speakers. Um, but there's, I mean, even learning English, like, what's the point, you know? And that's kind of a bummer. Um, but it is what it is. Yeah, it is, especially in the U.S. Because, of course, in, in England, they might go to the rest of Europe. So maybe they'll have the motivation yeah. to learn some other language. But... In the U.S., you really don't have much of a point. No, no, not at all. And even when they start teaching us different languages, they start teaching us so late that it's way mm -hmm. harder for us to grasp. Like, you really don't start taking your first language classes until you're in high school. So at that point, you're already 14 yeah, years old. When we already know that science tells us that you pick up on language easier at, at, as a child. So, yeah, that, that's hard, too. Yeah, the younger the better. Yeah, right. And what was your favorite thing about that trip? Um, my favorite thing. I think that my favorite thing about traveling to Brazil was the fact that my Brazilian counterparts didn't let language be a barrier from connecting with each other. Um, because some of my Brazilian counterparts didn't know how to speak English very well. So if we did try to talk to each other, it was with very broken English, and we were like trying to trudge our way through understanding each other. You can connect with a human beyond talking to each other. Like there was one night um, where we had a big celebration. We all had like dinner together, and then we danced the night away, and all of us could like listen to music. It didn't matter if it was Portuguese or if it was American music, but we could all dance to it and have a good time. You know what I mean? So it's just like yeah. there's there's um, other ways that we can connect as human beings beyond just language, and so that that was really cool to experience. Oh yeah, Brazilians definitely know how to have a good time. <laughs> oh yeah, don't even, I mean we, I feel like we got on the dance floor maybe at like 8 o'clock and then people were going until like 2 o'clock in the morning and we're like, oh my god, like how much more energy do we have, people? And that's still early for a Brazilian actually. <laughs> oh, and also, going to Brazil was the first time that I was in the Southern Hemisphere so it was, um, I saw a whole new set of constellations at night in the sky. So that was really cool too. So you, you are a stargazing kind of girl? Yeah, yeah. I love um, looking at the stars. I think it, it definitely brings a sense of wonder because space is so unknown to us as humans mm -hmm. and it's so vast. It's really hard to comprehend how vast space is. And so I'm familiar with a lot of the constellations in the Northern Hemisphere. So when I went to the Southern Hemisphere, and there's was, there was a whole new set of stars, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've never seen these stars before, and I've never seen these constellations. That was a cool realization too. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think I never realized that. Like yeah. Going to the Northern Hemisphere, I never noticed the oh, different constellations. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that you, you talk about that. Yeah. And I know we've talked about this already, tangentially, or your book talks a lot about this as well, if you think about it. But if you think about it today, what would be your definition of success? My definition of success would be authentically pursuing what I feel um, is my purpose with as much you know dedication that I can. And so I really try not to tie my success or my identity to things or to achievements or to um, statuses. Um, and although I do have goals of like being a New York Times bestselling author, I don't want to just feel successful when I hit that milestone. I want to be able to feel successful just knowing that I put in the work to get there and that I have put in the work to becoming a best-selling author, but also to becoming the best mom that I can possibly be and the best wife that I can possibly be. And just knowing that um, whatever I put my mind to, I've actually done it. Because ever since I was a little girl, I've always thought about like um, 
Because I always, I always thought about, I don't know why, but I always thought about like World War II and how women started um, working in the factories because all the men were fighting in the war. And I was like, if I was alive during that time, how would I act as a woman? Like, would I want to be the type of woman who was like, yes, I want to work in the factories, I want to do this, like I want to advance the rights that women have or would I be the type of the woman who's like I want to stay in the kitchen and I want to keep having <laughs> babies and you know do all these different things so I just thought about like who do I want to be and I always wanted to be the type of person who fought for what is right actually took the risks and took the jump or the leap to make their dreams a reality and to do what they always wanted to do like I just did not I don't want to waste my life because I know that I only have one life so if I say that I want to be an author, then I'm going to freaking be an author, you know? And if you could talk to little Jade, the Jade that used to think that kind of thing, mm -hmm. what would you tell her? Yeah, I'd probably tell her to, like, keep doing what you're doing because it is um, leading you to the type of person you want to be. You will, the t you will be the type of person who will be countercultural if that's what you believe and if that's what you think is right. You will be the type of person who takes the risks to make their dreams a reality. You will be the type of person who chases their wildest dreams. Like keep doing what you're doing because even though it's scary and it's hard and you don't know how things are going to end up, and I still feel that way. I'm still scared of my future. I still don't know how my future is going to end up. Um, but just knowing that every day, working towards it, like, just keep doing what you're doing. You're on the right path and you'll get there eventually. That's awesome. And if you had to summarize your book in a sentence or a paragraph, how would you summarize the gist, the nutshell version of Dreamer to Doer? Yeah, I'd probably say it is a book about practical and tangible ways that you can make peace with your past and leverage the visions that you have for your future to make your wildest dreams a reality. And where can we find your book and where can people find you as well if they want to talk to you? Yeah, so you can find my book on Amazon.com. It is available worldwide. Um, and I also sell it on TikTok. So if you'd like to buy it on TikTok shop, you can do that. Um, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok under the handle at author Jade Cessna, all one word. And then I'm also active on X, aka Twitter, and you can find me at Jade M, as in Mackenzie Cessna, is where you can find me on X. And what about Medium? Do you still write over there? Or not? I don't. I don't write on Medium anymore. That was really just a, a launching pad for my writing, and I've been slowly trying to move my blogs that I wrote on Medium to my personal website. Oh, so now you have your personal website as well. That yes, JadeCessna.com. You can hit it up over there. That's awesome. And talking about the launching pad and keeping those habits that you had to form to become an offer. Do you still write 1,500 words a day, usable words a day? How, how are you with those habits right now? Or yeah, are no. you taking a little break? No, 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 no. I do not write 1,500 usable words a day. Um, I usually write around 500 words a day because I write every day for my newsletter. I have a daily newsletter. Um, and then I write for my second book. Um, and I'm not trying to write the manuscript for my second book as quickly as I wrote the manuscript for Dreamer to Doer. So I'm doing about 500 words for my second manuscript as well every day. So it's about a thousand words, give or take, every day. And what's the second one going to be about? Yeah, the second book that I'm writing is about the transition after school, whether that's after graduating high school or college, into the quote-unquote real world. And it's a book about all the things that I wish people told me that I could expect about the real world that nobody prepared me for. So um, Dreamer to Doer is really like a tangible do this, do this, do this, and this is how we're going to, you know, kind of launch your dreams and prepare you for making them a reality but this second book goal or the second book is more about 
I'm just going to tell you what you need to prepare yourself for and then you need to do the best that you can because there's not many solutions that I offer in the book. It's more of like, here's what you can expect and here's maybe how we're going to get through this, but I don't exactly know all the right answers yet, that kind of thing. Yeah, so Dreamer to Doer was a blueprint of sorts and the next one will be more about a bunch of topics of things that can happen when you're getting out of school. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Like trying to prepare for the unpreparable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's the thing is like writing books is a little intimidating because A, um, people get an insight into exactly how your brain works. Like when my family and my friends and my peers read my book, they're getting insight into how my mind works. And that's a very intimate information that you get to know. Um, but also like my opinions change. In a year from now, I might not agree with everything that I've written in this book because I'm continuing to evolve as a person. I'm continuing to learn and to grow and things like that. So I just hope that people can understand that just because I write something as a 23-year-old doesn't mean that I'm going to believe or think that for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. But I didn't see anything that you should be... <laughs> ashamed of in the future so <laughs> good, i don't think good. you have to worry that there's much. No, no nobody can cancel me for anything that i wrote about right <laughs> yeah i think you did a good job of editing out the cancelable bits oh there was definitely a few things i had um i had a beta editor and then i had a real editor and the beta editor she was like you cannot you can't put this in the book on a few things. And I was like, okay, we're just going to get rid of them and we're going to not even think about them anymore. Yeah, now I want to see the original then. The raw manuscript, see, yeah. Yeah, the right. raw manuscript must be a lot of fun to get into. <laughs> yeah, I will carry that to my grave. Nobody's going to see that one.